Welcome, everyone, to episode 67 of Ohio Unsolved. I'm your host, Matthew, and welcome back from our week off. We're going to jump right back into this week with the Cumminsville killer who claimed five victims in the Cincinnati, Ohio neighborhood. We also have the return of listener stories with a spooky story from one of our listeners, Clint. So let's just get right into the episode. Everyone sit back, make sure to lock your doors and windows, and get ready for Ohio Unsolved. The Cumminsville Killer, also known as the Cumminsville Ripper and the Slouch Hat Man, was an unidentified serial killer who is believed to have claimed five victims in the Cumminsville neighborhood of Cincinnati, Ohio, between 1904 and 1910. In recent years, theories have surfaced tying the murders in Cumminsville to the Dayton Strangler, another unidentified serial killer believed to have been active in Dayton, Ohio from 1900 to 1909. On April 30, 1904, 32-year-old Mary McDonald from Saginaw, Michigan was horribly murdered at the Big Four Railroad Railways. McDonald lived with 24-year-old Miss Finley on East 7th Street, and on the date of the murder, she had been spotted by several witnesses in the vicinity of Chester Park. Later on, McDonald visited the homes of the Stagmans near Knowlton's Corner with Charles Stagman later driving her back to the city. At around 11 o'clock, he left her on College Hill Main Street, and that was the last time she was ever seen. In the morning, the dying McDonald was found on the railway by a freight train engineer and taken to the city hospital where she only managed to say her name before succumbing to her injuries. She had a bruise on the back of her head, her left leg being severed up to the knee and had been robbed of all of her money. There were two theories surrounding her death, that she had been murdered because of jealousy or that the drunken McDonald, allegedly accompanied by somebody, had met her in by an oncoming train. Neither theory could be backed up by evidence especially the latter, as conductors and motormen questioned around the city did not recall a woman resembling McDonald boarding a streetcar. Soon following her death, the case was quickly forgotten. On October 2nd, Louise Muller's body was discovered in a clump of weeds in the district's lover's lane. Muller had two deep wounds extending down to her face and the base of her skull had been fractured. According to several witnesses, Muller, who had multiple partners, had planned to visit her lover, Frank Eastman. She had been observed listening to a socialist orator's speech near her home and not far from the lover's lane. Initially, it was also thought that she had been struck by a train, but it was later changed to possible homicide. There were no strong suspects in the killing, as Muller had no known enemies and had been on good terms with her several lovers. On November 3rd, the body of 18-year-old Alma Steinweg, a highly respected telephone operator, 
who also sang in her local Episcopal church choir, was found in a vacant lot at the Spring Grove Cemetery near Winton Place by a streetcar conductor. Steinweg's head had been bashed in with a club, her eyes wide open and some teeth missing, and her face was in a pool of blood. In her hand, she held a transfer ticket. A bloody trail indicated that her corpse had been dragged into the open field, apparently by a large man, as noted by the footprints left behind, which were from heavy boots. The day before, Steinweg left her office and was telephoned by her boyfriend, who offered to pick her up. However, Steinweg replied that she had been to a dance and was tired, simply wanting to return home and lay down in bed. She was observed boarding the streetcar with a man, as told by conductor Frank Limey, who he had claimed often rode alongside her. It is suspected that she had been attacked while waiting for another car at Winton and was clubbed from behind, not having enough time to react. During his initial 1904 murder spree, the killer also unsuccessfully attacked several other women, who later gave descriptions of their attacker. After failing multiple times to kill another victim, the killer ceased activity for six years. The cases are the following. Mrs. Clausing, the daughter of gardener Henry Clausing, was on her way to a party, and when she crossed a bridge near Elmore Street, a man jumped out of the darkness and snatched her purse. She was then hit with a hatchet on the head, and in her fall she struck the railroad tracks. Clossing was left lying there until she was found by a group of men who carried her to the nearby saloon. Immediately, two doctors arrived on the scene, with one performing the examination. She was later taken to the hospital and treated for two weeks by the same doctor. Her parents wished for the case not to be disclosed by the doctor until the murder of Steinweg had occurred. Mrs. Harry C. Wines on November 6, while her husband Harry was out to the pharmacy to buy some medicine, a loud knock was heard on the door at 11 p.m. Mrs. Wines opened the door at the front of which a short, thickly built man asked for food. She declined, and the man pretended to leave, but instead he slipped back to the rear door of the house, and he hid behind it. Mrs. Wines then went out to the backyard, failing to see him in time, and was then seized by his strong grip. She struggled hard, but only managed to let out one piercing scream. In the meantime, her husband had returned after changing his mind of going to the pharmacy, and he heard his wife scream. He raced through the house to her aid, but was heard by the assailant, who had quickly fled. Although Mr. Wines attempted to chase him down, shooting at him with his shotgun, the attacker escaped into the darkness. Dorothy Hannaford, the daughter of Samuel Hannaford, had just left a meeting of the Young Woman's Christian Association returning to her Winton Place home. While waiting for the trolley car to arrive, not far from where Steinweg was murdered on the same night, a short, rough-looking man jumped out of the bushes and grasped her arm. Hannaford began screaming and was just about to get dragged to the tracks when a trolley car approached, causing her assailant to flee immediately. As a result of her experience, Dorothy was taken ill but otherwise unharmed. Mrs. Unkabak and Mr. Hadgerdorn, only an hour after the Hannaford attack, the two neighbors of the family were attacked in a nearby area. Mrs. Unkabak's arm was seized by the attacker, but Mrs. Hadgerdorn mustered all of her strength and hit the man in the mouth, making him stagger back. Mrs. Unkabak then joined her friend in beating him, forcing the perpetrator to flee. The Weimer sisters and Mamie Roddy on November 4th, the day after Steinweg's murder. The trio were attacked while passing by the Spring Grove Cemetery. A man appeared out of the graveyard shadows and began hitting the girls, pinning one of them to the ground. However, he was outnumbered, 
with the would-be victims pulling his hair and aiming for his eyes, and the attacker was forced to flee, disappearing amongst the gravestones. Mrs. Uh, Wurgel, her mother, and Mrs. Robert Kelly, while passing through the woods on the back side of Spring Grove Cemetery at night, the trio encountered the now sought after Cumminsville killer. The women screamed and rushed through a cornfield and back onto the street while the man went back into the woods. Mrs. Philip Gerbig, on November 17th, Mrs. Gerbig was attacked near the location of Steinwig's murder. On the two separate occasions, to her luck, she managed to fight off the attacker both times and run back to her house. And then Josephine Hewitt, on November 22nd, while on her way back home late at night, Hewitt encountered a rough-looking man who emerged from within the Spring Grove Cemetery. He tried to grab her throat, but she came prepared, and after she hit, had hit him in the left eye, she pulled out a revolver. The assailant noticed the weapon and started to run, with Hewitt firing until every chamber of the gun was empty. Not wanting to wait to find out if she had hit him, she ran home as fast as she could. The detectives investigated the attack, but were unable to find any trace of the man. On New Year's Eve, 1909, the body of the 36-year-old secretary for the Wilberhanner Lumber Co. was found near the railroad tracks in Cumminsville. Her mouth had been gagged, her throat cut, and her face beaten and bloodied in the same way as the previous victims. According to police, within 20 minutes of leaving her workplace alone for the first time, Lloyd was waiting for a trolley car near the Spring Grove Cemetery when she was attacked. The assailant dragged her to a suitable spot, and after a great struggle with the physically strong Lloyd, the man managed to kill her, possibly with a meat cleaver used in butcher shops. The following day, her body was found by two boys who quickly contacted the police. The police later found Lloyd Satchel a mile away from the crime scene, with all of her money gone. Emma Lloyd, her mother, was reported as very ill from the ordeal, while her husband, Edward, insisted that police do better work in finding the culprit. The tensions around the murder got so high that for some time authorities believed that there would be a race war. As a response, the City Council of Cincinnati announced a reward of $2,500, and members of the lumber company issued a reward of $5,000. On October 26, 1910, the body of the 26-year-old Hackney, who had moved to the city with her husband Harley in 1906 from Louisville, Kentucky, was found in her Canal Ridge boarding house home by her spouse and one of the boarders. Her throat had been cut from ear to ear, her skull crushed, with her body and face slashed in several places, apparently with an axe. A search of the home revealed no other crime had been committed. Despite the killer leaving behind the bloodied axe, as well as a bloody thumbprint on the door casing, police were unable to determine whose they were. In a last ditch effort, authorities drained a nearby canal in the hopes of possibly finding more evidence, but nothing turned up from this action. According to all the women who survived the attacks, the Cumminsville killer wore a dark slouch hat and was short and heavy built. However, the victims were unsure when it came to his race, as some claimed that it was a white man while others thought it was a black man. On January 13th, the police received a letter in which the writer claimed to have witnessed Lloyd's murder and her killer. Police tried to contact the author, only listed as SDM, only to later learn that the claim was just a sick hoax. Henry Cook, a butcher by profession, was the prime suspect of the trio to have killed Lloyd, as two girls, one of them being 14-year-old Tilly Krebs, identified him as one of two men whom she had seen leaving the crime scene on the date of the murder. Soon after his arrest, Cook was taken before a magistrate and his bond fixed at $1,000. No newspaper reports at present exist of the outcome, but it is most likely that Cook was released due to lack of evidence. 
George Lewis, a Marine fireman native of Cleveland, was arrested in Wyoming, Ohio, and was reportedly pretty vague about his whereabouts during Lloyd's murder. However, he was later released as authorities from Hamilton confirmed that he had been in prison at the time of the killing. James Fields, the only black man arrested from the trio, Fields was held together with Cook for some time. It is unclear what exactly happened to him, but seemingly as police began suspecting that a white man had committed the murders, he was most likely released. Harley Hackney, the husband of Mary Hackney. While returning home from work with the border Charles Eckert, the duo found Mary's body in the home. Both were arrested on suspicion, along with Herman Sherwing, but as there was no evidence, all were subsequently released. Hackney was about to move to Alabama when he was given a witness subpoena by the coroner, forcing him to stay. Although an official inquest was started into his wife's murder, it was fruitless and nothing ever came out of it. Charles Eckert, a young boarder in the Hackney's house. Charles and Harley were returning home from their jobs at the lumber mill when they happened upon Mary's body. Eckert denied anything to do with the killing, and since no evidence was found against him, he was released. Herman Sherwing, a black driver of a milk truck, Sherwing was arrested upon suspicion along with Hackney and Eckert, but denied having anything to do with the murder. Like the others, he was soon released for lack of evidence. At the time of Lloyd's murder, detectives made an effort to connect her murder to a similar series of killings, which occurred in the city of Dayton, spanning from 1901 to 1909. Five women were murdered in a manner reminiscent of the Cumminsville murders, and the fact that the killer also wasn't apprehended led some to believe that the two murderers were the same person. Although a mentally unstable vendor named David Curtis confessed to the Dayton killings, nobody was arrested, and these murders also remain unsolved. I think in a future episode I'm going to cover those Dayton murders as well. But let's move on to our next story. Our next story comes from a listener and it's one of his many paranormal encounters. I look forward to him sending more stories to share with everyone. August 8th, 2022. At approximately 7.30 p.m., I was on my way home from my son's house after babysitting my grandkids all day. About halfway home, I come upon a fire truck blocking the road, and he flagged me down to turn down the side road. So I made the turn and I continued on my way. Then all of a sudden, that little inner voice popped up, telling me not to go home just yet. So I turned down another side road that takes me to a cemetery that I had been doing some EVP work in as of late. After pulling into the cemetery, I grabbed my phone and I messaged my oldest son. He's a deputy sheriff in our county, and I knew he was probably on duty. I asked him what had the road closed, and I waited for his response. When he answered about 15 minutes later, he said very briefly, fatal wreck, car versus asphalt truck, driver of car deceased. We know her dad. A minute later, he sent me her name and my stomach turned, mainly because she was leaving behind a five-year-old daughter and I knew her. She's one that when I was a cop, I had to deal with quite a few times. She was only 25 years old. He sent me another message, one with a photo attached. It was a horrible scene. Her car was mangled. She was still in the car with a white sheet covering her body. She had apparently went left of center and struck the large truck head on. Neither one had time to even hit the brakes, so both were at least doing 55 miles per hour on impact. In the photo, there were two firefighters standing at the driver's door looking down into the car. The look on their faces was one of numerous emotions and questions of why. At the passenger door was the county coroner and the fire chief. They too were looking down into the car. My son had been very close by when it happened, so he was the first on scene and had climbed into the wreckage to try to help her. 
She was trapped, and all he could do was try to talk to her and hold her as she quit breathing. She had never opened her eyes, but was still holding very tightly in one hand her cell phone. But I found myself being drawn in time and time again back to the photo. I kept hearing a voice telling me to look again. You're missing it. I kept looking and looking, but I couldn't figure it out. Not until I enlarged it, then it hit me like a bolt of lightning. I physically couldn't breathe. I was in shock. Total disbelief. Almost 25 years in law enforcement with dozens of accidents, and I had never experienced this. After enlarging the photo, what I saw was something straight out of a movie or a book. There, behind the two firefighters at the driver's door was a face. Bold and almost solid, but just a face. The face of a young female. A young lady known to me as Melissa, the deceased driver. But it was her face as she had looked about four years ago. I even went to her Facebook to confirm this. She was looking down into the driver's area with a look of total shock, questioning what had happened, I'm sure. I showed the photo to my son the next day, and when he looked at it, he turned white, eyes wide and jaw dropped. He instantly saw her. I hadn't told him anything about it, I had just showed it to him. I showed that photo to a select few that knew of her, each one instantly saw the face. My son had taken the picture. He said something, just kept telling him to do it. I believe if we leave this world in an instant that we can sometimes get left behind for a bit. Maybe so that we can reflect back on the cause. The accident was her fault. Maybe she had to figure it out. Thank you, Clint, for this spooky story. I look forward to any others that you have and would like to share with the podcast. This also goes to all of my listeners. If you have a story of your own that you would like to share, feel free to send it to me through Facebook or email, and I will share it on a future episode. Now, our final story comes from yourghoststories.com, and as always... I'll be reading from the author's perspective. I had taken Sally to my mother's for a weekend visit. I'm not sure on the year, but I'll guess around 1987. My mom lived in Iowa. Sally and me were visiting from San Francisco. For years, I had promised Sally that I would someday take her for a trek through my haunted neighborhood. This particular time, she held me to it. We began by heading north up my mom's street which meant that we were heading up a rather steep hill. At the top of the hill, we crossed to the opposite side of the road and then entered a yard. It was quite dark. As I grew up to find familiar paths from my childhood, we stepped over plant material that felt spongy, and I remember thinking things had changed since last I'd made the neighborhood rounds. The yards there in the old neighborhood are massive, with backyards the size of football fields or better. Finally, we got trespassed to the back of said property, and there found a lovely little bridge crossing a small creek. And then a short walk from there, we were on another path that led through the next yard, then onto the street north of Mom's. We headed west, past dark homes resting in ample yards, toward the S curve in the road. As the lower half of the S, toward the north, was the house with the totem pole. Let me tell you, this thing is weird. It doesn't stand upright, but is instead curved like a huge donut sunk half in the ground. It felt cold like ceramic or plaster, but I now guess its composition to be a fiberglass. It was decorated with an array of oddities. A huge ear, the face of a king off of a deck of cards, a large brain, mushrooms, and I can't remember it all. The thing looked like an acid trip, realized in an incredibly weird sculpture. We stayed for just a short time. 
I was leery of the large dog that I knew to have patrolled the property some time before. Though it was creepy, we hadn't yet felt haunted. We made off for the church grounds. Once there, we lay down in the parking lot to catch a glimpse of the expanse of stars above. That parking lot, historically, was always where I would acquire the littles, the little folk who then would always follow myself and my guest on the remainder of our exploration. That night, though, we thought we'd heard the littles telltale whispers and giggles. Something else seemed to pervade. Not a sound, but a sense of darkness. It felt malignant, vile, evil. Sally and me sat bolt upright with and instinctively began to scoot slowly so our backs were together as we sat. The little whispers and giggles were stifled as birds and crickets before a storm. The silence was obvious and unnerving. We moved to stand and a growl met us. Though let me explain, it was less a sound than a feeling. We decided that we should run and I decided to cut through the Robinsons, a densely wooded yard that opens to a field which leads back to Mom Street. The growl moved in front of us. Mind you, I could physically see nothing, but the presence was unmistakable. I gently touched Sally on the shoulder, indicating the direction of our next move with a nod of my head. But I didn't stray my eyes from the spot my senses told me was occupied by this thing. Suddenly, I burst off toward the road, not even wasting time to go through the Robinsons. Instead, we went through another yard, long as the other yards, but not as densely treated. As we moved toward the back, perhaps 100 feet from the house in the side yard, the thing tried to get in front of us. By now, it was making such a racket I thought that I would go mad. I can't tell you now the sounds. I can't make my mind remember them. In fact, I wasn't sure at all if the sounds were in my head or not. And then I noticed from the corner of my eye the lights had flickered on in the Kazuski's house, and heads could be seen peering out towards us through assorted windows. Somehow, knowing that others could hear or sense the thing terrified me even more. I had ducked down the hide next to a truck topper, which had tall grass all around it. It was where the lawnmower couldn't reach. Sally dropped to her knees next to me, gasping. What is that? She screamed in a whisper. For a moment, I didn't feel the thing impeding our path. I took the moment to bolt. I hate to say it, but I was literally out to save myself, not even stopping for a millisecond to check that Sally was surviving. I had got to the gate that separated the Kuski's yard from Mom's neighbor across the street's yard. I was freaking out and not having an easy time with the latch. And again, the thing loudly made its presence known. Finally, the gate was open and we were sprinting across the expansive lawn toward the driveway. A long and winding drive. The formal garden surrounding the house is separated from the front by a long line of trees, which run parallel with the creek. As we approached said line of trees running so fast, nary a step touched the ground we awoke what sounded like hundreds of sleeping birds who all at once fled from the trees screeching and making a horrid sound then i wasn't sure if it was birds i heard or the thing which pursued us or both i should mention here outside of abject fear there also seemed to be some weird time space thing happening i can't explain or describe it Everything just felt twisted and not real. Perhaps it was just terror. Finally, out of the trees and making our way toward the front gate, we didn't break step until we hit the gate and made to climb over. I felt the men in the omen who were running from the evil dogs in the cemetery and had the terrible thought I'd impale myself. I managed not to. We ran across the street toward the warm glow of the lights lining my mother's front walk, then could detect the comforting sound of my dog, Benji, barking in the backyard. We ran up the driveway and crashed through the back gate to collapse on lawn chairs, panting and laughing, almost crying and trying to get a word out. 
As we got our thoughts together and could finally talk, we sat and related in hushed voices what each the other had felt and seen. As we did so, we could hear that my tiny horses in the pasture behind Mom's house had come up to the fence. My dog trotted down to the stone path to say hi to them, and we followed. Eventually, we stood at the fence, petting the animals. Before me was Zeus, our largest stallion. I remember now, in hindsight, that he was acting odd, skittish, but at the same time, I guess I was trying to make things as normal as possible and I shook it off. Presently, Zeus took a long step back, an awkward movement, because he did so with only one leg. He lung then looked straight at me and commenced to urinate, a long and drawn out piss. His stance was, how shall I say, almost threatening, like he was a bull preparing to charge. As Sally and me were witnessing all of this, the thing drooped down from us from above. There were no trees directly above, just an old-fashioned typed electrical line. It dropped to the ground directly between Zeus and me, but on my side of the fence. When I say it dropped, I mean we could hear it. We could feel the thud reverberate through the sound at our feet. Again, let me remind you, I could physically see nothing, but my brain attempted to create a mass in the general vicinity of the thing. Still, I seriously don't remember physically seeing anything. Anyway, the horses, including Zeus, erupted into wild neighing, bucking and kicking, and then scattered as if wolves were after them. Absolutely speechless, I looked at Sally, my mind groping for any sort of reasoning. Benji broke me of my revere, though I doubt it lasted for more than a few seconds. Benji was barking and making for the house. Again, we followed him. The flight was excruciating. For a moment, I could not see the house nor the back porch, our supposed safety. Instead, I saw myself from behind running in panic, as though I saw it through its eyes. We made it to the porch. Benji was already inside via his own doggy door through the back door. I was tempted to jump through it myself, but my higher logic convinced me to just use the doorknob. Sally and me didn't stop until we had run to the front of the house, to the front and formal living room used only when mom had guests. Once there, we were oddly calm, collected, moving pointed, pointedly. I went to the secretary in the corner and removed the pen and paper. Sally switched on the stereo and retrieved a bottle of Merlot from the wine cabinet. I sat on the sofa, pen in hand, with a mind to write of our experience. Sally sat on the floor near the serving table and poured us both a glass of wine. Though out of breath, we refused to show it. We were fine. My cats, one by one, began to saunter into the room, noticing that we were out of sorts, but not wanting us to think that they cared enough to show any concern. Just when everything was beginning to feel alright, a huge cat fight erupted under the sofa upon which I sat. I mean, you could see fur flying out from below. And of course, you know how awful that sound is. There was no doubt in my mind, at the time at least, that my cats were fighting the thing right under my caboose. Now that's where the story ends. I know Sally and me took that bottle of wine to my bedroom, where we sat with every single light on. We did not speak further of the incident that night. We simply waited for the sun, and thankfully, the wait was uneventful. Well, that is going to do it for today. Thank you all for listening, and I hope that you enjoyed the stories. Once again, thank you, Clint, for sending in your story. If you could, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. A five-star rating really does help others to find us. Don't forget to share with friends and family. Make sure to join us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to us on YouTube. If you do enjoy the podcast, please consider helping to support the show by subscribing on Patreon, 
with monthly bonus episodes being available from the $5 tier. There will be links to everything in the description. Once again, thank you all for listening, and make sure to keep your doors and windows locked, and stay ready for Ohio Unsolved.